Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of The Living Legends where we interview usually champions from tournaments, from weekend tournaments and we've decided to add a bit of a twist and this time we are inviting every single team that got qualified for the European Masters Tournament. Yesterday we had an awesome interview with Team France and today we have another country that has the colors blue, white and red and it is... I am talking about Team Norway. How are you doing guys? How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Doing great. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, I didn't mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Holy. Uh, it's gonna be very interesting. Are you nervous for this interview or are you just feeling... Ah, uh, it's another, it's another interview. I'm chill. <laughs> I'm not nervous for Inti, but it's uh, just not another Inti, you know. No, that's fine. I don't know. Just answer questions and yes. be fine. Ah, uh, okay. Just a quick roundup. Even though you can see the names on the screen, downside, it's Trish Fangirl on my... Is that the side? Nope. Is the other side? No, it's the other side. The, the other side, it's Marcus. And on the bottom right, it's Redegar. Uh, yeah, he's the Discord mascot for today. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, let's let's not kick in with questions regarding Rune Terra because, after all, we are not taking this interview just for that. We're taking it to let people know who you are in real life. So, who you are behind the Rune Terra mask, for example, who are you, Marcus, behind the Rune Terra mask? Um, so my name is Marcus Lettweit, which is a name that is almost impossible to pronounce in English. Um, outside of Runeterra, uh, currently I'm studying. I've worked earlier as a teacher. And my hobbies outside of gaming include mostly running and training. Uh, I do like fitness seven times a week. So yeah, I like to keep fit. You said you worked as a teacher. What, what did you teach people? Esports. Esports. Hmm. Yes. And I'm curious. Can you develop that? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Okay. So in Norway, we have something called Folkeskole, which is like a one-year boarding school type thing, where people can just take a year, uh, develop some skills, or try something new. And basically, I was uh, um, one of the teachers at uh, esport course that we had, where basically they came and they lived on campus for a year. And they could try to develop themselves either as a, like an esport player, a coach, uh, a commentator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we would set up like training schedules for them, uh, and that kind of stuff. And why did you not continue with that, if I may ask? Uh, because it was on the other side of the country, and I wanted to move home with my uh, to my family. So I kind of boring reason, but yeah, it was a it was a really fun job though. He is a family boy. He is a family boy. Nice. <laughs> And Trish, who are you Bisa, behind the LOR mask? Uh, I'm not very interesting. I recently graduated with a bachelor in social work. Uh, I'm unemployed right now, so if you have a job lined up for me, just uh, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> but uh, I know that's about it uh, for now. I mean, maybe you get a job as a professional esports player coming up after this tournament when you are going to perform. You already did a good job qualifying actually in Norway, so... We're expecting nice things out of you. And last but not least, Redegar, who are you beside, uh, behind, not the LR R mask, the Discord mask as well? <laughs> uh, so I'm a 23-year-old male that lives in Oslo, and uh, I recently graduated as an economist. Oh, economics. And, uh, and as uh, Trisha, I am also unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> So we need to change the name of the team from Team Norway from uh, to Team I'm searching for a job. <laughs> uh, team Welfare. <laughs> Quite accurate. <laughs> Marcus, maybe you can find a gig for them. <laughs> mm, it's gonna be hard since I'm on the other side of the country, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Very nice. And speaking about your backgrounds and who you are behind the mask of this game, uh, what's your background in terms of card games, actually? For example, Marcus, what's your background in terms of card games? 
Uh, I don't actually have that much competitive card game experience. Uh, it's mostly Gwent, which I played on the Pro Ladder, and I also played a little bit of Hearthstone, for example, in the Norwegian League, probably the same as uh, the guy besides me played in. Um, other than that, my competitive esport background is actually mostly in RTS, in StarCraft II specifically. Um, I pretty much played that for like almost 10 years, so yeah. And my what, competitive background. What made you switch from uh, RTS to the card game genre? Uh, because, especially StarCraft 2, it's like such a mechanically demanding game that unless you have like a lot of hours every day that you can dedicate to it, it's almost impossible to stay at your current skill level or if you want to climb especially, like you have to grind so hard. Um, and I just didn't have the time. Um, so I figured I would go into something where I could dare craft a little bit more, which I can do whether I'm working or whether I'm doing other stuff. So, yeah. So you qualified while you are doing something else, I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Trish, what, what's your background with uh, card games? I think we've talked before that you, you had a background in Hearthstone. I, I have a background in two games. Uh, I have a background in... Uh, I played Pokemon TCG when I was a kid for like one or two years. Uh, I got uh, the second place in the Youth National Championship in 2005. Playing some homebrew deck against the person who... Uh, he copied the deck of the person who won the World Championship the year before. So, uh, my run ended there, and I had like one or I think maybe two top four finishes in city championships. So I played a bit when I was a kid, and in Hearthstone, I was, depends on how we view it, but I was arguably the best Hearthstone player in Norway in the start of the scene. Oh. And then I kinda, I, I take losses really, really badly. So after a few rough tournaments, I took more of a backseat in the scene and I mostly did uh, deck preparations and deck building for tournaments for people I knew. Uh, and then I quit about like, I completely quit like two and a half years ago from the game. So that's like my background in uh, card games. And speaking about being uh, uh, not so familiar with losing, are you breaking stuff around you when you are, when you are losing or something like that? No, I just get really, really down on myself. I remember mistakes I did in tournaments five, six years ago. Uh, which really sits with me still. So I, I, I just get super down on myself for like a long, long time because I didn't play completely perfectly, which even if you can argue if there is something called completely perfectly, but uh, it uh, it wasn't fun. So I figured out, you know, it's better for my mental health to not play as much tournaments if I can avoid it. I completely understand. I would ask Redegard the same question, but I think his internet is not working properly, so we're gonna wait on him and in the meantime I'm gonna address you kind of a similar question, Trish. Uh, why did you choose Runeterra? What was the motivation be be behind uh, choosing Runeterra as your CCG? Uh, I honestly don't really remember. I think I saw 6 of streaming it or something in a beta. I was like, this looks mildly interesting. Uh, so, I got into the beta. It's one of the reasons I have uh, meme account names, is that uh, I had several TFT accounts. Uh, and uh, this one was... With, like, like I had several TFT accounts, and all of them had like the same formula of names, which was like... Character, Fangirl69 on every one of them, because I tried to get... I tried to get into... I tried to go 10-0 in TFT. And I kept making new accounts until I managed to do it. Um... Fuck, I sidetracked completely here on uh, the question, but uh, I think it was just like it seemed interesting enough and, uh, That's about it. It was a fun game to play for a bit <laughs> And speaking about the name How did you come up with all these names? You you said you had more names like this How do you come up with them besides the fun girl part? <laughs> uh, I don't know it, it was to make it it was be before they changed like the right login system, right? So I wanted to have accounts with similar names so it was easy to change between accounts and like remember all my accounts as good as possible. Um, and I don't really have an ID I identify with. I always change IDs in every game I played. Uh, so it's like how bad my imagination is that day depends on what ID I end up with for that game. I got it. It seems like the Trish account brought you some luck. Maybe you are considering to name your other accounts in other games, Trish. 
Uh, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I kind of hate the name. It's a bit funny, but still. Yeah. Okay. And Marcus, how about you? What made you play Runeterra? What was the reason behind? Um, there are multiple reasons. The first one is just that I was like, oh, Riot made it. Because I know that Riot games, especially because of League, like tend to have esports scenes. And I was like, okay, so this is a card game that hopefully, unlike, for example, Gwent, is not going to die like in the first year or something. Um, so I was thinking it from a, like a competitive standpoint that there should be tournaments here for me to compete in and they should support their uh, competitive ecosystem. So I had that expectation, which kind of made me like, be like, okay, this should be like a good card game to compete in. The other thing is that it's very uh, like nice with cards. Like you, it's not like Hearthstone, for example, where I remember like ha not having played for like a couple of expansions, and I literally spent like four hundred dollars uh, buying cards to get up to speed again. Uh, so having that aspect also helped as well. And the third reason is that I'm a swim fanboy. So whenever Swim jumps game, I tend to follow. So he jumped from Dota Underlords, which I played, to Runeterra, and I was like, yeah, this looks cool. And then I kind of just tried it out in the beta, and I was sold once I played it, so, yeah. And speaking about the competitive scene, are you right now currently satisfied with it, or what would you demand out of it? Um, I think Riot is taking steps in the right direction. I like the fact that they're doing like seasonal tournaments with like sizable prize pools. Um, although I wish they would be a bit higher, especially when you compare it to something like Hearthstone. Uh, the EU Masters tournament and the format is pretty cool as well. Um, I do have some like issues with the format, format, especially for like the seasonal tournaments, with so many players and it being single elimination all the way. But outside of like nitpicking the formats of the tournaments, I think the steps that they've been showing recently um, are really good. So I'm looking forward to the future. Yeah, very nice. I, I really hope the competitive scene is gonna develop more because, as you said, that's what you expect when you hear it's a Riot game. You are expecting to give it something big, something like, let's say, words for League of Legends. And they are now not called Riot Games anymore for some weird reason. Now they actually have more games. Yeah. Anyways, guys. Uh, seems like Redagar is having some technical issues, so we're gonna proceed with the interview. Maybe he needs, maybe he'll come back. He needs to come back. Hey, coin flip. Hopefully, so. Sometime, no, no, see. Um, and hello, Broken Ball as well. Uh, so, Trish, do you have a favorite card? And if you have one, why is it uh, your favorite card? Uh, I was looking at the list earlier because I completely forgot about this part. I think uh, overall, I think uh, Reunion is probably my favorite card. I like I like big control tools, and the art is really cool. So it's like design-wise, I really like Reunion. I think. Uh, did you have any cool Reunion in any game on ladder, or maybe you tried some tournaments for fun? <laughs> I think any cool Reunion happens when my opponent is less intelligent and overextends into it. Like when you hold 9 mana, and for some reason they keep developing the board. That's like the only fun ones I have, but nothing that sticks out. It's a special ruination at all now. Okay, we know what's your favorite card, but do you have any card that you hate specifically? Maybe in this meta, maybe it was in another meta? Uh, I mean, in the early days I despised Deny. 3 mana Deny was just a disgusting card. Like, no, like it was not fun to have in the game at all. Uh, currently, I don't think I have any card I hate, but I think I'm starting to develop some uh, some hate against. I think uh, I think the landmarks, just in general, especially uh, the healing landmark, is uh, it's a bit an interactive in the sense that if your deck doesn't have a good matchup and you don't have a way to kill it, you eventually just lose the game. That's kind of boring to play against. I mean, I think it's, it's, the, like... it's the most played landmark, and uh, the deep landmark is coming is coming strong from behind. Yeah, I think just having a landmark as a win condition is kind of cool, but until you have enough ways to deal with landmarks, it's kind of uncool, I think, to play against. Uh, I mean, now I'm speaking from my personal point of view, but I don't really enjoy when I see right, right there big on the card you win the game if you meet a certain uh, a certain uh, a certain thing like Fiora. You kill four four uh, units, then you win the game. 
The yeah, like... difference though is that Fiora is very intractable, like there's a lot of ways to stop mm -hmm. her. But currently Landmark has so few cards to interact with it that it's like kind of go fish. You're like, okay, do you have an answer? No, I won the game. Oh, uh, you don't have an No, you do have an answer? Well, I guess I just lost. It's kind of binary in that sense. It's kind of like the, when you mentioned Fiora, the an, an yielding spirit Fiora deck, which was either your deck has a way to go... So either you have will of your Ionia, or you eventually lose the game if they get fear up to see Yielding Spirit. So, wasn't fun to play against. You're, are you talking about the days when uh, Al Yielding Spirit was burst? <laughs> yes, when it was burst, yeah. Uh, that shit was scary. I can guarantee that. It's good that it's gone. Also, the days when Fiora, when um, standalone Fiora was a thing, those days were scary as well. <laughs> True, but you could still like beat it by interacting with the game at least. Though you know it, you might just auto lose of uh, auto lose the game, of course. But there's like a lot of decks you will just auto lose against if they draw the right cards. It's kind of how a card game goes. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen that you are not pretty fond of the landmark system as well, Marcus. Especially those you cannot interact with. So, do you the card that you hate the most? Is it a landmark or is it another card? Um, I'm actually not sure. I don't have super strong feelings about any card in the current meta, but in general, I hate cards that ruin my aggro decks. So historically, my two most hated cards are probably Radiant Guardian and Eye of the Dragon. So if I was gonna mention my something, man. it would probably it would probably be Eye of the Dragon now, since Radiant Guardian isn't played that much. But yeah, the moment like if there's a card that hits the the board, and I'm like, oh, I just lost the game. Man, oh, oh, I'm like, it's so annoying. I'm just like, oh yeah, Radiant Guardian's down. Like, I guess I'll just concede and go next. Uh, so yeah, I have a, I hate that combo passion. Yeah, and since you were speaking about aggro decks, is your favorite card an aggro card or is it another card? Uh, I was thinking quite a bit about this, and I play pretty much every type of deck. Like when I won a set of Targon, I played War Mother, Lee, and Pirates, so I had like a combo control and aggro deck. But if there's one type of deck I really hate, it's aggro that doesn't have over the top. So board based aggro that, that like, let's say your board get avalanche and you just have to GG. I hate that. So one of the cards that I like the most is decimate simply because that if my board gets cleared, if the opponent's HP is low, I know that if I just top deck decimate here, <laughs> I'm all Gucci and nine out of 10 decks can't even interact with it. So decimate. Is that also the card that you identify yourself with? <laughs> Probably. Nice. So you are an aggro person at heart, I like that. <laughs> Come here, bro. <laughs> and speaking of which, Trish, do you have a card that you identify yourself with that is similar to yourself, maybe some of the traits you have? Uh, I was thinking about this quickly, and I think Ash and Crocolet, because I'm actually gonna devour both my teammates just to get a win out of this. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? Uh, I mean, I was the one who qualified us, so I'm probably the best player here. So I might just have to step on both my teammates just to get the win. Are you gonna just say it in public like that? That you're going to step on your people's <laughs> necks? <laughs> just, uh, I mean, I have to win no matter what, and that's just how it's gonna be. To oh. be honest, I wouldn't mind as long as we win either. Like, winning is what matters here. We don't... That's everything true. else with details. I mean, it's what they say, you know. Uh, it's not about winning, it's about having fun. Mm. Yeah, we just reverse that. Uh, unless, <laughs> reverse. unless you lose. <laughs> <laughs> unless you lose, it's no fun. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Seems like Redogar is not coming back <laughs> any, anytime I, soon. I think he yeah, tapped out, sadly. Yeah. Oh, I'm sad for him. Speaking about sad, do you have, uh, Trish, do you have any sad or maybe any funny moment on the ladder that you remember? Oh, uh, I think this is like the thing I don't have any good answer to, but uh, I saw that I was looking at Fresh Lobster's, uh, Fresh Lobster's run to the qualifier and I saw that I was the last guy he lost to on the ladder. So uh, I was almost the one who killed this run. Well, not the last guy, but like before he started this like insane winning streak, uh, I beat him. So I don't know. I felt like I was close to like beating his entire run by taking his LP. 
which would have been a bit sad because that was a really really fun run to watch. <laughs> so imagine if you would have queued against Lobster many more games, <laughs> you would have ruined his qualifier spot. <laughs> would have been uh, would have been terrible. <laughs> uh, how would you have felt about it? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have like. <sighs> I don't know, I didn't see, like, I wouldn't have checked his match history if he didn't qualify after all, so I wouldn't have known at all. So, so just how it goes. Well, fair point. Uh, how about you, Marcus? You also have a little bit of, a little bit more of tournament pedigree. Do you have any funny moment from the tournaments or maybe from the ladder? Hmm. Uh, I guess I have a couple. One was when I played in the fight night. Uh, I think it was two or three weeks ago. Uh, no, it was actually Ascent of Tari, never mind. And I was playing against Swim in the uh, uh, winner semis. And I was playing so bad. Like, it was probably my worst match of the entire tournament. And, like, I was like, oh my god, I'm just throwing this and I'm throwing this. And then somehow I just kind of top deck every single game and won in the end. And I, I was like, oh, this is, this is, I was like feeling so bad for Swim. So I just like, we had like this discussion about the entire set afterwards because I was like, oh, sorry, man. I, I, I hope you win in the losers because I was feeling like so bad because I just top deck like, every single time. Uh, other than that, I think, uh, when Targon first was released, uh, everyone was playing with these new fancy cards. And I was like, hmm, Targon is pretty much only slow speed spells and low attack units. So what if I just go first some spider and burn? And so I literally just queued up on ladder, farmed everyone, and especially Alan, because Alan was experimenting a lot with, uh, uh, with the new cards. And I think I just queued into him like three or four times and beat him every single time. And he was like, this deck sucks. He's playing such a bad deck. This is trash. He might have won, but this was so trash. <laughs> and it was just kind of hilarious to see. Like I, I checked the, the, the stream after like every game. I was like, Hmm, this is this is kind of interesting. I don't think it's that bad, but yeah, it was like, yeah, it was kind of funny. Did you feel a bit proud of yourself because you got that inter that interaction and that reaction out of Alan? <laughs> I don't know. I just think it was kind of funny. Like, it happens every expansion. Like, people are trying new stuff, but I but I was like, okay, so how do I abuse these new cards and. And it worked out pretty well, and it was kind of funny when people were raging because they were like trying to play these big units like Axel, and I was like, no, 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 the game ends at turn five. We're not, we're not playing like. <laughs> so yeah. So your playstyle is like kill your opponents as fast as possible. If not, move to the next game. You don't have time to lose here. <laughs> yeah, on ladder, it's mo yeah. it's mostly like that. Yeah. Speaking of ladder. You guys had to fight quite a bit. I think everyone had to qu fight quite a bit for the climb. So, did you guys have any fear at any point that you are not going to qualify? Who wants to begin on this question? You can start, Marcus. Okay, so I wasn't afraid that I wasn't going to qualify for the Norwegian team. Like, to qualify for Norway, like Radiger had like 80 LP or something. Like, I was guaranteed to be on Team Norway. The problem was, was there going to be a Team Norway? So, uh, especially towards the, the last few hours before the cutoff, when I started going on my losing streak at 480 LP, I was like, oh no, I can't win this, I can't actually make it. So I kind of just had to put like all my hope on this random dude who I didn't even know who was, <laughs> called Trishfanger69, and hope that he qualified, or got our country qualified. So, it was a bit nerve-wracking to see whether Norway would actually be like, a part of the tournament. But I knew that if we qualified, I would be the second seed no matter what, so... Yeah. Well, I guess... Um, thank you, random dude, for qualifying Norway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're saying that you were guaranteed second seed, but for most part of the qualifying, I was number one and number two seed. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I was, I, I was quite, like, first of all, I was pretty sure that was a second account, so I didn't yeah. really count it. And second of all, I felt confident that I could have climbed higher than that. The problem for me was like, will Norway make it? Are we safe? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It was really nerve-wracking. I don't have a lot of faith in my own abilities and skills in general. So I tried to get to a safe rating, as safe as possible. That was one of the reasons I played two accounts is that I have insane ladder anxiety. Like, it doesn't matter if something is on the line or not, but when I get high up on the ladder, uh, I get so stressed. 
So yeah. I, I climbed like 100 LP at a time with each account, like jumped each account. Like I got the 100 LP on one account, leveled my second account to master, got 200, then 300, then four, and five. Then I, I, I made a boat I counted 400 LP at one point. And I think it was like a really bad idea how I went about it, but it kind of worked out in the end, luckily. Would you consider yeah. that you are a person that's Uh, stresses a lot on ladder and uh, if not what do you think was the hardest uh, thing you need to, you needed to do in terms of climbing i think the hardest thing to do is that i uh, my brain is not functioning very well i do random game losing mistakes out of nowhere like place i know 100% sure is going to lose me the game but i just kind of something slips in my head so i have these games like probably like once every 10th game i'll do something completely out of the ordinary that will lose me the game So it was kind of about avoiding messing up at any point like that and uh, just convincing myself to queue, which was like the hard part, like making myself queue, not <laughs> not hope for others to mess up, I guess, was kind of the hard part. Well, you did it, you queued and you won and now you are the first in terms of points in your country, so congratulations on that one. <laughs> Yeah, I had, uh, but yeah, we're talking about fighting each other. I think I found Marcus on like two accounts because he kept King more mothers and I kept playing the analyst in. Yeah. I, I probably stole like 200 LP off you between my accounts. Yeah, I was talking with my brother actually. I was I was like, dude, I'm playing against this cursed fangirl again. And I, I'm giving him points, it looks like. Uh, because I think you were above me then. So I was like, well, I mean, Obviously, I can't throw games. That would be against the TOS, but I'm playing War Mother against Lee. I don't need to try. He's going to beat me. So I was like, whatever. Either he gets points or I get points. This is, this is good. This is for, uh, for yeah, Team Yeah, it was, was good. Yeah, and what was your hardest thing to do in terms of climbing, Marcus? Um, first off, I have quite a bit of flattery anxiety, just like my, uh, my fellow Norwegian here. Once I get up to a certain point, like especially once I past like 450 i was like oh this is so stressful what if i lose a game uh so it was kind of hard to press myself to queue and play enough games like even now like i struggle playing more than like 10 20 games a day um because eventually like the stress just kind of gets to me uh the other part was actually the problem that like especially the day of the cutoff uh the cutoff was so late and i'm a, like i'm a morning person i'm not an evening person so after like 9 p.m. or something, my brain just kind of shuts off. But I still had to climb. So I was climbing like, yeah, that's, that, that looks right. Yeah, yeah, that, that, I think that's good. And I was like, I wasn't focused at all. So uh, I had a really hard time struggling there towards the end. Uh, because yeah. of how late it was. Yeah, I had a queue at like 11, 11 p.m. I think. Because uh, Turkey passed me. I was at 5.38 LP. And I was, I was super, super tired. I didn't want to queue. And... Uh, I don't know, I was, I was shaking playing that game, even if I had a good matchup at a terrible hand. It was, uh... And the deadline was like at 2am, right? And I didn't want to go to bed, and Turkey just would not give up. That was kind of the most annoying thing. Turkey had two guys, or maybe three, I think, who just would not throw in the towel at any point. Forcing no, me to just sit up and wait for them. <laughs> yeah. Did they... Did they eat each other on ladder at some point? <laughs> I think they might have done so towards the end, but I'm not sure if they actually ate each other or not. I think they just mentally boomed at one point and went on a losing streak when they were both very, very close to forcing people to queue. I think Ling Shui was three times he was within one win of forcing uh, Pokerwak to queue and start like the chain because after I won my game at 11, there was like a chain of like six teams that like if. Turkey won, then Pokerok had to queue, then another guy to queue, then another guy to queue, and then another guy to queue. So I felt kind of safe, but I was kind of stressed. But it was just something about how relentless Turkey was that was stressing me the fuck out. Yeah, I can definitely sense it. And this this was also a stress battle because, as you said, someone, you were in a safe place and suddenly someone goes up by even one point and you're like, okay, I need to queue because then I'm losing them. Another person that that thought it is safe, it's not safe anymore, I need to queue again, I need to queue again. And then maybe you queue more than one because you don't even feel safe. Okay, you won one, but what if the other guy comes back and gets more? It was so stressful. Yeah, I don't know. Dude, uh, I, uh, I, was, I was really, really relieved. Like... 
I know Alan killed. I think that was some of the most fun part was uh, towards the end, watching uh, everyone being in the Alan skill stream, watching uh, the end of the ladder deadline. And even when he was calling it over like an hour before, I didn't feel safe for, for like 30 minutes, and it was mathematically impossible in any way for Turkey to force people to queue. But uh, I don't know, I kind of regret doing the entire thing because it was not good for my heart at all at, at the end there. So is that what you felt when you found out that you qualified for Norway? Relief? Or was it something else that you felt? I was super, super, super relieved and uh, I was really happy with myself as well because uh, I played I played Rintera as said, in the beta quite a bit and I played for like three days this early, early December, like in the start of June and then I didn't touch Rintera until I saw the qualifier so I had like three weeks to get to uh, the top of the ladder so I was like happy with how much I improved in that short amount of time to get that high up. So it was that like relieved and a bit, a tiny bit of pride in uh, accomplishing it. How about you, Marcus? How did you feel when you realized that you are one of the people that are going to represent Norway in EU Masters? I mean, I was pretty happy because I don't know. I I wasn't sure if we were gonna make it, especially when when. Uh... When my teammate here had to start queuing up again, like he was at like 512 and then he had to start queuing up again. I was like, oh my god, what if he loses, you know? So I was really nervous about the whole thing. Uh, but I had to go to bed before the deadline. So I just woke up and like the first thing I did was like, who, who, who won? Who, who made it? And I was like, and I saw the list and I was like, 11th? Let's go, no way. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, I don't know who this Twitch fangirl dude is, but he's my hero right now. I was like, let's go. So uh, I was uh, I was quite relieved and quite happy about it, uh, but also a little bit disappointed because, like, one week earlier I was pretty much the best player in the world, and then a week not like later with the qualifier I wasn't even the best in my country. So I was like, hmm, that I it didn't take long for me to feel washed up to say to put it that way. But that's kind of ladder, right? Like in the early Hearthstone days, when you had like top six to qualify for the European Regional, uh, two or three of the three of the season actually that I tried to qualify for it, and I was in. I was within the cutoff on the last night, and then on the last day I had to like ladder. I just went on losing streaks. It's just kind of how the game goes. Yeah. Like ladder is super super fickle like that. You need you need luck as well to get there True. at the deadline. Yeah, obviously now you guys were happy, you you felt relief when you qualified, but let's cut the bullshit, now it's just a, just a week before the tournament starts, so do you feel nervous, do you feel not confident? I think we have a pretty decent shot, like, I mean, I feel like every team in this tournament is so even and so close, that there isn't like... Like, no matter who we're up against, we can beat them, and no matter who we're up against, we can also lose them. So, I'm not really that nervous. It's like, eh, it can go either way. So, I think if we just do our best and, like, focus on what we need to do, I mean, it will go as it goes. I don't know. I don't really have, like, huge expectations either way. So, I just want to do my best, and we'll see where it goes. I think, uh, I, I know from experience I get extremely extremely uh, stressed when playing tournament games that's just how i am built i am i'm used to it and i know it but i know i get stressed and so, so i know that when the tournament starts i'm going to be very very stressed no matter what and but do you, do you have any yeah, method that you can cope with that stress uh no i just i just i just play and uh, then i either feel like a god after the game's over or i feel like the worst player in the world it's just no in between so I mean, but I've got like I got a lot better at handling the stress than I used to be. But I know I, I know I'm going to be stressed. That's just how it is going to be. Just try to cope with it. But I, in general, I'm less stressed playing team tournaments because it's a lot more fun and it's not as reliant on yourself uh, performing. I can totally agree with that because I played in the IQ qualifier as well and. I felt relieved that I can communicate when when you can verbalize your thoughts and when you express them and there is a guy that tells you hmm this doesn't sound right or asks you do you think this is right tell me why or tell me why not then the thought process keeps on going and you finally reach a decision in a team that's best for 
for the play that you're going to make and that's nice when you're playing in a team it is and in this specific tournament what do you, marcus you said that uh, each team seems like pretty even anyone can beat anyone but do you have something like a top three countries that uh, you think are the best in this tournament excluding norway um i think germany for sure after that, I'm a bit uncertain. I think it might be Spain and either France or Poland, I think. I think those are like the three, four teams that I think are the strongest. But I mean, there are a lot of other teams that I can contest them as well. And why the toss between France and Poland, if I may ask? Um, I think it's just really even and it also depends on the team di dynamic. And I kind of agree with my teammate here that uh, Alan can sometimes be a very dominant personality. So depending on how that goes, that might be either like a bad or sometimes a good thing. Um, but as like the individual players are really even, so it all just kind of comes down to how they work as a team, I think. Definitely. How about you, Trish? Do you agree with Marcus here or do you have uh, a different top three, let's say? I don't really have a top three, right? I like I said, I, I played a beta and I played the last like three and a half weeks of the deadline. I don't really know any of the players, like how good they actually are. One thing is getting high up on the ladder, right? But even I got high up on the ladder to qualify for this. So it's like uh, I said that I am afraid of. I think I think it goes for two teams. I'm afraid of both uh, Poland and France because of the same reason earlier. People were that confident in their own skills to keep playing when they are guaranteed to qualify, like Alex and Alex Q did, that's... I think those players are really scary, and those people are usually some of the best players in a game. Uh, people will have that uh, faith in themselves, I'd say. So I think that's what makes those two teams scary, and I think that goes for... I don't remember which country it's from, I'm gonna check, but I think the guy called Ratchet Kata? He's from I think Bulgaria. That might... He's from Bulgaria. Bulgaria, right. Because he was at 580 LP two days before the ladder 